Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 101 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name's Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour, I'm gonna be ranting away at you, talking about things important to me I think are worthy of your attention and your concern. Uh, if you have any reactions to the show, you can email me. In fact, you should. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And since I know you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed around here a couple of times during the show. You can get the email address from there. Uh, when you send me email, two requests. One includes something like, you know, left side of the aisle or cable show or whatever, something like that, so I know it's not spam. And uh, second of all, uh, please be a little patient. I do answer my email. I am sometimes a little slow about it, so hang in there. All right, with those traditional introductions out of the way, let's get to it. Now, I'm going to start with, as I like to, start with some good news. And not surprisingly, because this is where most of the good news these days seems to come, it has to do something to do with same-sex marriage. Uh, last week, Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper, and I... I love that name, John Hickenlooper. Uh, anyway, Governor Hickenlooper signed a law uh, recognizing civil unions for same-sex couples in Colorado. The law goes into effect on May 1st. Now, the thing is, in 2006, Colorado was one of those states that got stampeded by bigotry and fear into changing their state constitution to define marriage as one man and one woman. So the legislature could not pass a, a uh, same-sex marriage bill. However, there was nothing to prevent the legislature from recognizing civil unions with, that are basically the same, essentially, as marriage in everything except the name. Colorado, Colorado will thus join eight other states uh, that have civil unions or similar laws. In addition to that, there's a handful that have some form of domestic partnerships, which provides at least some of the same rights that marriage or civil, or civil unions do. And nine states and the District of Columbia allow for same-sex marriage, a number that might increase by two this year. Now, all this, of course, takes place in the atmosphere of the Supreme Court, considering uh, two, two issues. One is California's Proposition 8, or Prop 8, as it came to be known. Uh, and the other is the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, DOMA, it's called. Oral arguments on these cases took place on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and these or or oral arguments took place in the face of an increasing tide of expressions of public support for same-sex marriage, a tide that, in fact, um, threatens to go beyond an outpouring and go right into a deluge. In addition to high-profile names, such as Rob Portman and Hillary Clinton coming out for same-sex marriage recently, uh, there are a number of lower-profile but still politically significant names, including current senators Claire McCaskill, Mark Warner, Jay Rockefeller, and Tim Johnson, as well as former senators Bill Bradley, Tom Daschle, Christopher Dodd, and Alan Simpson, who those four submitted a friend of the court brief to the Supreme Court endorsing same-sex marriage. One of the things significant is that those four, plus Johnson and Rockefeller, all voted for DOMA when it was before the Senate in 1996. Meanwhile, the American Academy of Pediatrics just released a, a, a statement declaring support for marriage equality, I'm quoting, for all consenting adults as a way of providing long-term security and benefits for their children. They also supported full adoption and foster care rights for all parents, regardless of sexual orientation. The American Sociological Association uh, has just declared that studies show that children in same-sex households do just as well as children in opposite-sex ones, uh, which actually meant they rejected one of the arguments that was used uh, in opposition to same-sex marriage. In the, course of, in the course of this statement, in fact, the association specifically and by name repudiated a junk science survey done last year, which claimed falsely to have proven that in terms of child welfare, a, an opposite sex marriage is the gold standard. Oh, and by the way, if you care, the American Medical Association endorsed same-sex marriage over 18 months ago, declaring that a ban is discriminatory and that it actually creates disparities in health care that are damaging to both families and their children. 
Now, standing against this, standing against this tide, we have people like retiring Senator Saxby Chambliss, who, re who expressed his staunch opposition to same-sex marriage last week by saying, and I'm quoting him, I'm not gay, so I'm not going to marry one. A statement which I doubt is going to leave a lot of broken hearts in its wake. Now, the thing is, there is no particular reason to think that the reactionary wing of the Supreme Court uh, will remove their ideological blinders and take account of changing public opinion any more than they've taken account of, of precedent in other decisions. But on the other hand, it has been long said that the members of the court do read the polls. And it's possible to wonder, it's legitimate to wonder, how many of them are prepared to have their legacy, part of their legacy being declaring that they were on the wrong side of history. Uh, and by the way, it will be interesting, one last thing on this, it'll be interesting to see how Chief Justice John Roberts reacts to the fact that a lot of the briefs by right-wing groups uh, define marriage very narrowly as, uh, as one man, one woman, and their biological children. That's family to them. And uh, John Eastman, who chairs the National Organization for Marriage, in fact, just recently referred to the adoption of children as, quoting him, the second best option. Uh, John Roberts and his wife have two children, both adopted. All right, moving on from there to something I mentioned this last week, and I said I wanted to talk about it, so I will. For at least the third year in a row, the Congressional Progressive Caucus has produced a proposed federal budget. For the third year in a row, this is a budget that actually reduced the deficit more than either the Republican or the Democratic one, uh, and did so without going after Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, or other domestic programs. In fact, it strengthened them. And for the third year in a row, despite or in fact because of its merits, it went down to crushing defeat. 84 in favor, 327 against in the House. Every gopper and a majority of Democrats voted against it. All right, what was in this budget that didn't even deserve the support of a majority of Democrats in the House? Well, it was called the Back to Work budget, and it focused on economic growth. It proposed a $2.1 trillion uh, a stimulus and investment package over the next few years, with $700 billion of that coming in the first year. It included $425 billion for infrastructure construction and repair, $340 billion in middle-class tax cuts, a $450 billion public works program, and $179 billion in state and local aid to relieve the pressure on local budgets. All right, what would this program accomplish? Well, according to analysis, it would create nearly 7 million additional jobs. It would expand the economy by nearly 6%. Uh, it would expand programs on education, clean energy, jobs. It would improve health care system. And it would protect not only the big three, that is Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, but it would also protect other programs for the poor and for the environment. All right, how would it pay for this? largely by raising taxes on the rich to levels which would actually be still below the rates that they paid during the Reagan administration and cutting unnecessary military spending. In other words, this budget would stimulate the economy, cut the deficit by $4.4 trillion by implementing a series of measures on both spending and taxes that enjoy public support ranging from mere majorities to overwhelming. So, of course, it was dead on arrival. Why? Well, why wouldn't it be? I mean, the fact that it works, the fact that the numbers work, and that it's based on policies the public supports doesn't count for anything when all of the serious people, all of the pundits and politicos, insist that you have to go after the entitlements monster in order to be serious. Don't confuse them with facts. And certainly don't expect anything to penetrate their insular alternative reality. Because in their minds, anything that doesn't attack Social Security and the rest, uh, anything that doesn't involve embracing right-wing talking points about how all our economic problems are the, are the fault of poverty pimps and greedy geezers, uh, anything that dares to suggest that maybe the rich should be paying taxes at the same rate they did 30 years ago, which is less than they paid 40 years ago, 
Anything that fails to express the required level of panic about the deficit crisis, anything of that in their uh, that does anything of that in their minds, it's unserious by definition, not worthy of consideration. Well, you know, the, the mainstream media types will snipe back. Well, of course it wasn't serious. Everybody knew it wasn't going to pass, which is true. Everybody knew it wasn't going to pass. Everybody also knew that Paul Ranton's budget was not going to pass. But that didn't stop you from breathlessly covering, oh, it's about to be released, it's about to be released, and then slathering over it with, with, with the loving strokes and extensive coverage when it finally did come out. The blunt fact is you have these two budgets here, and there were two main differences between them. Uh, one of them was a real budget that would have worked and improved the lives of millions of people. The other was a minimally altered rehash of long discredited talking points that not only would not have worked, it would have improved the lives only of the elite rich. For the other difference between them is that for precisely that same reason, the first budget was considered outside the range of acceptable debate and the second one was considered inside it. Again, precisely for that same reason, that the second budget favors the rich over, over the poor and the needless over the needy, and it undercuts the big three. That's why that second budget, the Ranton budget, got all of that coverage, all of that ink, and the first one, the Progressive Caucus budget, didn't. It didn't fit the acceptable mold, reality be damned. All right, now, if you don't believe me about the coverage, I'll tell you what. Go to Google News, go to any other major news aggregator, and do search. You'll find that links to the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget, stories on that, almost invariably come from sites like The Nation, In These Times, um, um, Think Progress, The Huffington Post, and other more or less acknowledgedly liberal outlets. Do the same for Paul Ranton's so-called budget, and it's full of links to the New York Times, to the Washington Post, to the Los Angeles Times, to the major news networks. The difference between these budgets and their respective coverage comes down to the difference between the rich and the poor, between the powerful and the powerless. Thing is, you know, it's not so much that we have government of, by, and for the rich. Uh, it's that it's a, we have a case where the rich get to set the rules. They get to set the terms of the debate. They get to define the limits of what's legitimate debate. Terms and limits that are then faithfully accepted by their media lackeys and their political puppets. So the point is, the alternatives of which the public become aware are limited to those acceptable to the rich. They don't need to rule. They don't need a plutocracy. They know that this way, they may lose a few skirmishes, but the trend is all in their favor, as our history of the last 50 years clearly shows. They don't need to rule openly. In fact, they prefer to rule quietly. They prefer to be the man behind the curtain who we never get to see. Now, there's an unhappy footnote to all this. Representative Raul Grijalva, uh, who was the author of the, uh, the Progressive Caucus's budget. He called the vote a good showing and said that every time we introduce this, we gain another 10 votes. <laughs> Terrific. At that rate, it'll take 14 years to get a majority. We're going to take a break. We're back. We're back. Well, you can, you, you can tell we're back. Okay. Anyway, uh, going on to uh, one of our regular features, the Clown Award. Uh, this given, as always, for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to our own Plymouth County Sheriff, Joe McDonald. It seems that Sheriff Joe was attending a Gopper St. Patrick's Day breakfast in Situate about a week ago and told a supposed joke about Barack Obama getting assassinated. Now, I assume you heard about this, but just in case you didn't, this, this is basically the joke. Obama goes to previous presidents to ask them what he can do to best serve the country. Um, Washington says never tell a lie. Jefferson says respect the Constitution. Lincoln says go to the theater. Uh, now, the joke, if you can call it that, is really utterly tasteless. Uh, 
especially at a time when gun violence is a topic before the public. Now, at the dinner, it apparently got, thankfully, only scattered laughter, according to reports, because apparently the audience had better taste than McDonald did. Instead of laughter, what McDonald got, apparently much to his surprise, was serious pushback from the blogosphere when uh, an outfit called Blue Mass Group posted an account of this. Now, you might think that the reasonable response of a reasonable person at this point would be to go, all right, yeah, maybe it was kind of tasteless. You know, it was only supposed to be a joke. I didn't mean to offend anybody. Sorry. And, you know, then move on. But if you think that, you don't know our Joe. No, instead, he went on about how the joke is 160 years old and was originally told about Andrew Johnson and has been told about various presidents since. And how is that supposed to make a difference? What is this joke supposed to be like, fine wine getting better with age? I mean, there are racial jokes, ethnic jokes, rape jokes, which are that old and older. Should we be telling them too on the grounds that, well, people are doing this for 160 years? And by the way, there were minstrel shows in 160 years ago. Maybe we should bring those back too. Now, I'm not saying this joke was nearly as bad as any of those. No, I'm not, because it, it isn't. But the point remains that just because something has been said before doesn't make it any less tasteless now. And I'm amazed and rather appalled by the fact that he just doesn't seem to get that simple concept. In fact, not only doesn't he get it, he turned it into an opportunity to rant about the blatant hypocrisy of the left and liken his opponents, his critics, to Nazis, saying, quoting, this is America 2013, it's not Germany 1936. In fact, to show how buffoonish the whole thing got, he referred to some blog post and said that now he had to worry about being charged with treason because of this joke. As the result of what? Some comment on some blog somewhere? I don't know which is more absurd, the possibility that he regards that as a serious risk or the possibility he expects the rest of us to take it seriously. There is one other thing, by the way. Uh, he referred to another joke he told at the same dinner, which he said, well, this didn't get anyone upset. This joke was about how Obama told the newly elected pope that he was glad that he, that is Obama, didn't get elected pope because it would be a step down from Messiah. Now, I can give you two reasons why that joke didn't offend anybody. First, it's funnier. Second, it's not about shooting somebody. What is so hard to understand about this? Now, the truth is, McDonald's right about one thing. This joke has been told by both sides about presidents from both parties, especially the last several. Uh, and it's not just been presidents. In fact, Hillary Clinton has been the target of this same joke. But that doesn't change the fact that joking about assassination, especially, again, at a time when the issue of gun violence is on the public mind, is utterly and thoroughly tasteless. And the fact that Joe McDonald can't seem to realize that and instead rants about hypocrites and Nazis marks him as a thoroughgoing, complete clown. All right, our last thing for today. Our last thing for today. I kept trying to prepare something to write something about the 10th anniversary of the start of the Iraq War, which was on March 19th last week. But I couldn't find the words. I couldn't find the words I wanted to express the sorrow and the anger. I couldn't express the words to express the memories of shame and frustration that I felt that we couldn't stop it. That we saw this war coming and despite the efforts of tens of millions here, of scores of millions around the world, we were like King Canute trying to hold back the tide in the face of a megalomaniac White House and a Congress whose members took their consciences and stuffed them under a pile of campaign contributions and who preferred to impose the risks and pain of war on others rather than accepting the political risk of casting what might have been an unpopular vote. In recognition of this anniversary, we have seen 
a number of media and political types offer their mea culpas. Um, they're shuffling their feet and going gee whiz and trying with varying degrees of embarrassment to explain away what they now admit is their disastrously wrong support for this war. And often in doing this, they fall back in the line, well, golly gee willikers, everybody thought Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. No, not everybody thought that. So consider this part of my notion, my, my, my ob observance of the anniversary. And I'm going to say in my own behalf, in September 2002, I was writing to my senators, telling them they should oppose any efforts to allow for uh, authorization to attack Iraq. In the course of that letter, I told about a silly joke that made the rounds when I was in college. A joke which proved not only that Alexander the Great had an infinite number of arms and legs, but that he didn't exist in the first place. The first sentence in this argument was, all horses are black, proved by blatant assertion. Now, it turns out, of course, later on that this statement is a vital link in this chain of logic. Uh, and so by accepting it, the listener had unknowingly helped the storyteller reach the obviously ridiculous conclusion. It was, it was, like I said, it was a silly, harmless joke. But I pointed it out in that letter to point out the real world dangers of accepting things proved by blatant assertion which is what the entire case for the Iraq war was. And in fact, among the things in that letter that I said was proved by blatant assertion was the claim that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And to back up my point, I was able to cite the work of former weapons inspector Scott Ritter and who was then the head Iraqi weapons inspector, Hans Blix. All right, and then on March 6, 2003, just two weeks before the war started, I wrote an unpublished op-ed, but it began this way. I'm quoting. Before we go to war on Iraq, there's a question about its weapons of mass destruction which, that needs to be answered. What weapons of mass destruction? Seriously, what weapons? Where? Months of effort, hundreds of inspections, and hundreds of sites. And by the way, we forget that by this point, the inspectors had been back in Iraq for several months. But all these uh, months of effort and inspections had turned up, for practical purposes, zilch. For months, the administration insisted it knew from intelligence reports exactly where those weapons were, what they were, and in what quantities. So where are they? So no, no, not everyone thought that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. No. The ones who did were the ones who wanted to fool themselves for their own purposes, and those in the public who were misinformed and malinformed by the pandering pundits either to, eager to get a good boy pat on the head from the political and media elite. Oh, plus those who were lied to, as we all were. We were lied to. Persistently, consistently, insistently lied to. The whole justification, every part of the justification, every part of the sales pitch for the Iraq war was a lie. It was all proof by blatant assertion. They knew, they knew it was all lies. They knew this. By the spring of 19, uh, 2003, they knew that their main sources, Ahmed Shalabi, a source called Curveball, and Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, were all known liars. They knew that when they sent Colin Powell to the UN, they sent him there with manufactured data uh, and, and assumptions, uh, and assumptions presented as irrefutable fact, as they took every maybe and possibly in intelligence reports and presented them to the public as definitely and unquestionably. They knew it was lies. They knew it had nothing to do with any threat from Iraq because there wasn't one. They knew it didn't have anything to do with WMDs because there weren't any. They knew it had nothing to do with terrorism because bin Laden hated Saddam Hussein more than they did. And they knew it had nothing to do with liberating Iraq. But it did rather have to do with the interest that dare not speak its name, oil. For which we now have confirmation from former Bush speechwriter David Frum, who just wrote in Newsweek of the big Dick Cheney, spending, quoting him, long hours together with Ahmed Shalabi, contemplating the possibilities of a Western-oriented Iraq, an additional source of oil, an alternative to U.S. dependency on an unstable-looking Saudi Arabia. 
So they got their war, and it was a complete disaster. Nearly 4,500 U.S. service people killed, at least 32,000 wounded, nearly a trillion dollars spent, and we don't know how many Iraqis were killed. The most conservative estimates, based on the strictest definition of a war death and the, the most certain, uh, most certain uh, uh, verification, is 112,000. Other estimates using standard methodologies and a broader definition of a war-caused death reach to one and a half million. What we do know is that there are now in Iraq today tens of thousands of people who have been blinded or maimed or crippled in the war. And what have we gotten for all that pain, all that suffering, all that treasure? Is Iraq a democracy? No. In practice, Prime Minister, uh, 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 Prime Minister um, uh, Muriel Malachi is consolidating his power and looks to be on the road to becoming a dictator. Is Iraq peaceful? No. Sectarian violence continues. Uh, it was un, un, almost unabated. The car bomb in this photo went off in Baghdad on March 19th. It was one of 12 bombs that went off in the city that day, killing 56, wounding over, two, uh, over 200. Eight more bombs went around other places in Iraq that same day, bringing the total to at least 65 dead. Earlier in the month, another bomb went off in Baghdad, killing at least 30. Unemployment is officially 10%, but some estimates say that's as high as 35. Many select basic services such as water and electricity. Corruption is rampant. According to a 2011 poll of Iraqi men under 30, 89% want to leave the country. And as for us, what did we get? We got an abbreviated list. We got acceptance of torture, warrantless surveillance, the Patriot Act, uh, vastly expanded government secrecy, and vastly expanded government power to poke, prod, and pry into our private lives. And you know what's the worst thing about this? We have learned nothing. It is 10 years net later, and the war drums are beating about Iran, based on proof by blatant assertion. Even, even Barack Obama just the other day said that, oh, Iran's a year away from getting a nuclear weapon. There is no evidence that Iran has ever decided to try to build a nuclear weapon. And yet, we're being sold proof by blatant assertion. It's 2013, and it's 2003 all over again. I'm going to leave you with this on a different thing. As of March 25th, 3,027 Americans have been killed by guns since Newtown. You have the best week you can.